Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I am Matt Three Beers in Gerasimovich. And I'm Cameron Lalana, and my new thing this week is completely revamping my room to fit more Soviet propaganda. This is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature, and as you've already heard, a drink or three or four. This week we're going to be discussing the short story, How Much Land Does a Man Need? by Leo Tolstoy. We'll be attempting to get to the bottom of this age-old question, how much <laughs> land does one man need? But before we get into that, Matt, what are you drinking today? I am drinking a beer that my girlfriend so thankfully picked up from the store for me a couple days ago. It is called Daisy Cutter. It is also brewed Ooh. by Half Acre Beer Company in Chicago, same um brewery that i was drinking from last week this is one i I pointed out in the store i was like deciding between the one i drank last week and the one i'm drinking right now and she remembered that and when she went to the store she picked it up for me and i was like wow that is the most awful thing anyone's ever done for me (laughs) 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 and it's really good yeah yeah thank you half acre please send me beer (laughs) (laughs) what are you drinking this week i am drinking i'm going off the beaten path of my usual array of stouts and i'm drinking a whiskey that my dad gave me for christmas it's nice. an irish whiskey red breast it's a single pot still 12 years aged just incredibly smooth super happy hopefully i don't get too drunk this episode because i also think this is really expensive whiskey and i don't want to like get blasted while i'm talking about mm-hmm. tolstoy well not that i you shouldn't do that but i think tolstoy would be feel bad and i would feel bad about drinking that much whiskey but We'll see. Tolstoy would encourage it, but only if you can chastise yourself in your journals later. <laughs> I think that's the way he would view it. <laughs> so why why is he not a Catholic? That's a perfect Catholic guilt complex. Uh, it's, I think we would need an entire episode to, to, to dissect Tolstoy's religious views, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, honestly, considering, considering how much Tolstoy we've been reading, it, it might be worth it. Yeah. Especially before we do a lengthier read. Yeah, the last time we did Tolstoy, I think it was Alyosha the Pot, I ended up spending like half a day reading uh, The Gospel in Brief, which mm-hmm. is his rewriting, uh, rewritten version of the gospel. Yeah. Uh, and I'm getting I'm getting pretty into this idea of talking about Tolstoy's religion because, wow, there's a lot to dig out there. Yeah, it is. We bring someone on to uh, talk to us more about it because it's an area that I'm lacking a little bit. So, you know, we'll see. That's fair. So what, how, how much Soviet propaganda are you putting into your room? Why, why, do you need to, <laughs> why do you need to revamp your room to fit? more i mean not that there can ever be enough but yeah that's true well i i I was had a lot of wall space taken up by the back of my desk and bookshelves so Mm -hmm. i i didn't have any more room for pictures because i collect art from wherever i go or just in general yes i do have a problem and Mm -hmm. i was putting it up and i put up all my art and i didn't put up any of my soviet propaganda so Mm -hmm. i needed to rearrange my desks and fit some propaganda in here because it's really important because right over my desk now i stare at a bunch of propaganda which is good it's really helps with um really helps when you're like working and you think i can't do this and you look up and you see the motherland or the personification of the motherland looking down at you sure yeah and i know i'll be struck down if i stop now so i i'm encouraged to keep going you got to keep it up (laughs) and well as as i mentioned i'm three beers in because uh for the viewers and listeners uh we messed up our time zones when we planned out our recording today so uh <laughs> i was already a little tipsy and then cameron said oh no i'll be at work for another two hours and i said oh good <laughs> <laughs> more time to drink it was indeed <laughs> okay <laughs> well <laughs> let's get into this age-old question of how much land a man needs yeah that's that's what i've been trying to figure out all day read the story <laughs> Yeah, it lets you know pretty clearly how much you need. So I'll go ahead and give a quick <laughs> summary, and then we will jump into some of the background details, some of the Tolstoy politics, some of the spicy nuggets that you will need to understand the story fully. So how much land does a man need opens with a meeting between two sisters, one older, one younger. I don't think they are named, and, well, that's just how it is in the story. They are only defined by who they're married to. They're only defined by who they're married to. Yep, this is something I want to talk about later, but this is... Not a story where any female representation is important to Tolstoy, apparently. Uh, the older one is married to a merchant, and the younger one is married to a peasant. His name is Pachum, and they are discussing whether it is better to live in the city or country. Another question that is just age-old in Russian literature. 
and they're going back and forth and Pachlum says my only grievance is that I don't have enough land give me enough of that and I'd fear no one not even the devil himself so the the devil hears this and he he takes it as a challenge the devil's there yeah the devil's there he's sitting behind the oven sure he's chilling he's chilling behind the oven yeah as you do as you do and so in an attempt to get more land Pachlum he buys 30 acres from an old lady who is selling it off for, I think, a total of 300 rubles. He's just trying to get rid of it. He is trying to establish his independence because he, he keeps getting fined, the person who's managing this lady's land. Uh, anytime the peasant's cattle goes and grazes on her land, he finds them, which he, he doesn't like. What he does is, is he, buys, he buys the land, and as Tolstoy says, he becomes a landowner in the truest sense of the word. And <laughs> basically what that means is it sets him up for issues with the other peasants. Uh, the other peasants are, they do things that Pachum doesn't like. They allow their cattle to graze on Pachum's land and they chop down his trees without asking or paying him. And he, he tries to be reasonable and he says, you know, if they chopped down only one or two of my lime trees, that would have been fine. But no, they only left me with one lime tree. What's a man to do? So he goes to the district council and he tries to impose fines on them. But there's really no no evidence because, they, you know, didn't have a... Uh, he didn't. He didn't have uh, security cameras or whatever all around his land, so there, it, it's inconclusive. He's not really able to do anything. He's more or less pow- powerless, and so he's really frustrated. One day, a peasant who's walking through or passing through the town lets Pachum know that there's some areas of, of Russia that are letting peasants settle there for really cheap. And so, when summer comes, Pachum sails down the Volga River to the Samara province to investigate. And he sees that the peasant was telling the truth. And so he goes back and he's like, all right, I'm going to take this boat down here. And he sells his land and his cattle at home and he moves to the Samara province. He's just given 100 acres of land, which is already more than he had total back where he was previously. 20 acres for each member of his family. He starts to feel cramped here too. And he's not able to grow enough wheat for his cattle and for what he thinks he needs. So he attempts to buy more land from a peasant who has made a bad deal and gone bankrupt. Before he's actually able to complete the transaction, he comes across a merchant, again passing through. He says, no, you don't want to buy that land. I bought 13,000 acres of Bashkir land for only 1,000 rubles. And all he has to do is bring a few gifts. And so Pachov is like, all right, that sounds awesome. I'm going to go do that instead. So he sets off to a Bashkir settlement and they agree to sell him as much land as he can mark in one day for a thousand rubles. So basically he has to set off at sunrise and he'll he'll dig a little hole when he turns and he's digging out basically a square rectangular plot and he just has to make it back by sunset. That's the only condition really. But he is so entranced by the land as he sets out to go and do this and he goes out farther and farther and he thinks, hey, you know, maybe I'll, I'll I'll plant some wheat there. I'll do this over there. This this spot is beautiful. I need to make sure that I have this in my land. And eventually, he starts getting really tired. It's obviously really easy when you set out at sunrise and you're like, it's nice and cool. I got some bread. I got some water. Uh, and he's really energized. But that does not last as he goes on through the day. And finally, on his way back, he starts having thoughts like, oh, I might not make it before sunset. I've gone up far too much to make it back. He does make it back i mean literally just in the nick of time he says the sun has set where i am but the peasants are on the top of the hill and it hasn't set there yet so he's hustling up the hill he makes it to the top of the hill and then he falls <laughs> over and dies and the story ends with a line pahlam's workman picked up the spade dug a grave for his master six feet from head to heel which was exactly the right height and buried him and the first time I read that, oh, did I have a good laugh. That was a really funny ending. <laughs> I mean, not for Pahom, because that's unfortunate. <laughs> not for the dead guy. Not for the dead guy, exactly. But oh, is it dripping with just condescension and irony from that. Mm-hmm. And this is a really short story. This is only, I'm reading a really small copy of this. Like, the book is physically very small, and it's like 20 pages. I think if you printed it on a normal size paper, it would be like five pages. This one, I, I think it, it gets overlooked, potentially. I see some people when I'm perusing through Instagram that are reading it and whatnot, but nobody really discusses this one, I feel like. And, and maybe there's not that much to discuss, but I think there is, and I think it's funny. I think there's a lot to discuss here. Maybe this is just spitballing, but it's kind of written in a kind of folksy style. I think the word is it's written in a skaz, skaz mm-hmm. meaning like folktale, more mm-hmm. or less in Russian. Um, so it doesn't really have a lot of the literary value, like for 
you know, through the word or prose, I mean, um, you would normally get from Tolstoy, which is, I think, part of the reason why he's writing it in this style. But we can get into that more later. Yeah, I mean, you're not reading Anna Karenina. You're not reading an excerpt from Anna Karenina. You're reading something distinctly its own. Yeah, it, like it's Ska's kind of descends from oral storytelling. So this mm-hmm. is a story that you really could, if you were to listen to it through an audiobook, you might almost make the assumption that this was made to be actually read or listened to rather than actually read. Yeah, it's quite distinct in Russian literature when it's written in this way. I I, I enjoy it. I think that mm-hmm. it certainly makes it a little bit easier to summarize because you get you get quite into it. <laughs> you don't have to yeah. deal with a lot of the things that Tolstoy does narratorially, if that's a word, in some of his other mm-hmm. works. Like you don't have to deal with the internal monologues and the switching of perspectives, points of view. It's very simple, straightforward for the most part. So let's dive into it. I'm going to start off with a little bit of context for the era that Tolstoy is writing it in. I'm trying to avoid making this too long. I only have four pages of notes, so I will keep it short for Matt's uh, really blockbuster follow-up. Since he's got, <laughs> he, did, he, did some, he did some hard work and read an actual biography of Tolstoy and now has information which cannot be found online, like I found online. Not for the podcast, just my grad school advisor made me do it. <laughs> Shout out grad school. <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's talk about the late 19th century so this was released in 1886 and that may mean nothing to you but this is a fairly important time in the russian empire as it's coming to its closing days and the most important thing to know is that it's basically not it's not collapsing at this time but everyone can kind of see something is going to happen soon Tsar Alexander II has been assassinated only five years before this. A number of other officials all across the Russian Empire are being assassinated by various radical groups, especially the Narodnaya Volya. And everyone can kind of see that you're coming to a crossroads here of where Russia as an empire is going to go. So at this point in his life, Tolstoy has recently gone through kind of a spiritual crisis, and now he's coming out as like a full warrior for God. And he's writing tracts and all kinds of things, which become very important in so many different domains. But one of the most important things for this episode is the concept of the mir. And what is a mir? If you know Russian, you might know that that means world or can mean peace, which is a nice sentiment. But it can also mean kind of a peasant community, a very particular type, which is a self-governing peasant community where all arable land is owned by the community as lo- along with uh, any forests, fishing areas, hunting grounds, etc. And that community levies taxes for the use of all these things. And that's not a uniquely Russian concept, but it is very important in this time period because it had been recently repopularized by an agricultural scientist, economist, and lawyer, August von Hochsthausen. If you're thinking that doesn't sound very Russian, uh, you would be correct. That was a German scientist who came to Russia to undertake a sort of study of Russian peasantry. And wrote a book, which in German has like a title, which is about a paragraph long, but <laughs> the English version much shorter. No, I'm, I'm serious. It's like it's like three full sentences. I'm laughing because I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in English, shortened and translated, it is the Russian Empire, its peoples, institutions, and resources, and that's published in 1856, and that is an absolute blockbuster in Russia because it puts forth the idea of the Mir based on Hochshausen's research in the Yaroslavl province. And if you're wondering why is a German guy telling Russians about Russia, keep in mind that the intelligentsia, the gentry of Russian society, were just leagues away from Russian and Russian Empire peasantry. They were not even living in the same worlds. They were often not speaking the same languages. If you listen to our episodes on Fathers and Children by Turgenev, you'll remember that Bazarov boasted to Pavel Petrovich that he could speak to the peasantry. And also the book reveals that the peasants laugh behind his back. There's a huge divide. And honestly, the, the intelligentsia and the gentry do not know that much about the peasantry. So this German guy who doesn't know that much about Russia coming in and talking to some peasants kind of reveals a whole new world to them. And they become enamored with this idea of the Mir. Uh, although Hochshausen is not the only person to document this notion. He's putting forth a very particular idea of what it stood for, which many groups, including most notably various Slavophiles, really latched onto because that was like a very particular Russian thing. And that was how they could put forth, these are unique institutions that we can use. We don't need Western democracy or stuff like that. We have, you know, uniquely Russian institutions. Now, 
one thing I should point out is that there is modern scholarship which pushes back on some of Hoxthausen's claims, or at least they have evidence that in the particular region in the Yaroslavl province which he was studying, the claims he was making was not true. That does not mean that the Mir is, is a false idea. Of course, it's been documented outside of Hoxthausen, uh, but merely the idea of the Mir in this period, there's not a lot of evidence for it in the Yaroslavl province. But it didn't need to really exist as Hoxthausen thought it existed because all the gentry and the intelligentsia thought it existed like that. And that kind of influences Tolstoy. Because Tolstoy, you know, of course, is a landowner himself. He has serfs who are tied to the land he owns. And he falls in love with this idea of Amir. And he talks about that a lot because he is really obsessed with this idea of land. And why? Why be obsessed with land? Well, keep in mind, again, like I've mentioned... This is a, an incredibly divisive point in the Russian Empire. You obviously have the Slavophiles and the Westernizers who've been duking out for like the last 50 years over various reforms, liberalism, czarism, etc., etc. You have the Narodnaya Volya being influenced by people like Bakunin, who are now carrying out campaigns of terrorism across the whole of the Russian Empire with the goal of bringing down the Tsar. You're only about 10 years away from the creation of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, who would later split into the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. You're very close to the creation of the Social Revolutionaries. And, you know, Tolstoy is seeing this whole thing ending badly. So he wants to create an alternate ending for Russia. And he wants to create, like, a kind of a true Christian Russia. And what does that mean for him? Uh, like I've said many times, he was very, very religious in the end. That was all he really cared about, that everyone kind of start following Christian teachings. He wrote many tracts about this. And he was virulently against kind of all sides. He was militantly anti-capitalist. Um, he saw that as basically an evil visited upon Russia and that no one should own private property. He was also very anti-socialist because he kind of saw that as a bureaucratization of society. And he wrote, goes on in the spirit to write many books that influenced so many different areas. He writes, The Kingdom of God is Within You, which goes on to be a seminal text in Christian anarchism. Tolstoyan cults form around his writings, which uh, Gandhi was even, I think, a member of one in India, and I believe even met Tolstoy. He writes The Gospel in Brief, which was a huge ex influence on uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Tolstoy had a huge amount of influence, and he knew that. And this is worldwide fame at the time. He's kind of an unofficial sort of czar. And so he is using that influence to start putting forth this idea of the Mir. And he's using that to say, no, we don't need capitalism in Russia. We don't need to become an export society because what we really need is to form small peasant societies where you, no one actually owns the land. The village owns the land and they give out the land to people and they tax them based on the quality of the land. Obviously not all land is equal, which is why you have kind of a single taxing system, which was come up, which was uh, developed by an economist, Henry George, who Tolstoy is a huge fan of. And basically, like, that's what he really wanted most of Russia to go to, to get away from, from industrialization, to get away from what he saw as kind of anti-religious. And that is why he's so concerned with this notion of land. However, that can also kind of go awry with, say, a lust for privately owned land, which he is vehemently against. And that's kind of where we're, at least as I understood it, getting into some of the thinking behind this particular story. This is definitely a work from later post-spiritual crisis, Tolstoy, for sure. It also is pretty autobiographical in a lot of ways. It deals with a lot of things that he himself did, interestingly enough. Not that he ever had to deal with kind of climbing your way up from only having a little bit of land, because he was obviously born, born into very wealthy family but specifically the uh, the relationship with the bashkir people who are a nomadic people located in the southern urals the story as a whole it kind of shows this misunderstanding of cultural norms and it has these undertones overtones whatever you would like to call them of russian imperialism and this starts and it goes back with the russian conquest of kazan in the mid 16th century it's when they started conquering this area but during the 18th century, Central Asia as a whole was kind of considered the Russian frontier territory. So a lot of Russians were going out and settling on this land that had been subjugated into the Russian Empire. And during his life, Tolstoy actually did attempt to farm Bashkir land. He was horribly, horribly unsuccessful. He endured several years of bad harvest. He he visited twice uh, or se several times um but in 1873 and 1875, the Tolstoy family spent their summer holidays on their new state in the Samara province. He, he made the trip several times aside from that because he really loved Kumis, 
which is fermented mare's milk, which is referenced several times in the story. He was known to drink up to eight bowls of kumis in one sitting. And now I've never drank in this, but that's, it sounds like a lot of anything to drink in one sitting. <laughs> he, he believed that it had some sort of healing property and generally just like it was really good for your health, which was super, super weird for a Russian aristocrat at the time because you would just... Normally, you would go to healing springs in Germany or France for a Russian aristocrat to instead say, you know what, I'm going to go vacation in Central Asia and I'm going to go sleep in a tent for a couple of weeks and drink some kumis that was kind of unheard of. I just want to point out that this isn't about uh, kumis in particular. I just don't trust anyone who can drink eight bowls or glasses of milk, any type, Mm -hmm. in one sitting. That's just... I'm with you. Yeah, I just... I saw someone eating... I saw someone drink like two glasses of milk with spaghetti once, and that almost what? broke the friendship. So, oh my goodness! I just think people who drink glasses of milk plain are weird. That's the podcast official position. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. <laughs> yeah, this is the party line now. This is the party line. The party line is that Tolstoy is a weirdo for liking milk. <laughs> that's that's it. Yep. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I mentioned, he was really unsuccessful trying to harvest his land. There. Are horrible horrible uh, droughts throughout the time when he bought his land and he convinced his wife to buy this land because he said oh we only need two years of good harvest to pay back the investment because it's super cheap and as luck would have it that was not how it went for him because of the like historically bad droughts absolutely unheard of droughts and despite all of this the governor in the province he did nothing all he continued to do was pressure peasants into repaying debts and tolstoy as you know our aristocrat who liked to think of himself as a peasant in some ways this did not sit well with him so what he did was he went around his neighborhood and he collected intricately detailed statistical information about the extent of the drought's damage on the families that lived there and the impending damage if it continued to happen and the fact that there would be a famine and he played this up because he said oh the samara province is really important to the rest of russia because we depend on it for food which I, I don't know the exact dependence, but it was probably somewhat uh, significant. Or it caused national outcry in 1873 when he sent it and published it, and it resulted in an unprecedented amount of aid. It, people sent the government and private individuals sent two million rubles and three hundred and forty-four thousand kilograms of grain sent to the region, which largely alleviated the famine that they were facing. Which I mean, two million dollars, if you think about it now, is kind of a lot of money. But in 1873, that's a whole lot of money that was sent. And right. it caused this this almost scandal because actually, believe it or not, at this time, statistical information was so rare because it mm-hmm. was actually repressed because it, it was associated with liberal politicians in Western Europe. They advocated for the collection of statistical information to measure social progress. And conservative Russian leaders did not like that, particularly Nicholas I, who ruled into 1855. He actually censored statistical work which is wild to think about today and so this is one of the first in-depth studies to be conducted um about kind of the state of of peasants there there were some after nicholas I died and after the serfs were abolished there started to become this push to measure things statistically and that's kind of what tolstoy did by observing this and so it's a really interesting backstory to the fact that he wasn't just writing about something that he had heard of once. He was writing about something that he had actually lived through. And so that's my that's my fun biographical info. Thank you, Rosamund Bartlett. And thank you. your Tolstoy biography for that chapter, which I read <laughs> probably two and a half months ago. And I thought, when am I ever going to use this chapter about Tolstoy drinking all this kumis? And well, <laughs> <laughs> turns out, right now. Turns out. Um, I would thank you for that, because that was interesting, but I regret knowing that Tolstoy drank eight bowls of kumis at once. No, if I get to have that haunt my dreams, so do you. <laughs> All right, that's fair. <laughs> if I have to find out and have Tolstoy ruined for me this way, I'm glad that it's on, on air, Yes, so to exactly. speak. So let's talk about the story itself. <laughs> now that yes. we spent half an hour talking about history of Russia. I mean, come on, what are you going to do? So how did you like this? I think this was your first time reading it, if I'm correct. Yes. Yes, it was. I thought it was really interesting. As you can probably already tell from my analysis, what I took away from it was him condemning, I guess, kind of greed, um, which it seems like a kind of simple thing to take away from it from a man who's written stories with so much complexity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think Tolstoy kind of knew his audience, and you know, I think it's no accident that he's writing in the Skaz style. Uh, I think he's trying to tell a relatively simple morality tale set in 
a modern era for the readers because certainly he this is not his first time writing those sorts of things he wrote many uh texts which were supposed to be in, to teach peasants certain moral things that he thought were important or even the peasants on his land he wrote books of education for them so that's kind of what i took away from it him trying to condemn people who are always looking for like how they can expand their holdings instead of being happy with happy with what they have i think that this is there's so much to this one single point on why tolstoy continues to be read today and a lot Mm -hmm. of it is like you said oh maybe it is a simple point of he's talking about greed but that is part of what makes it interesting to read today because he's talking about Mm -hmm. he's talking about land but you could replace it with money or i mean it basically was at this point or you could replace it with anything and it's a an interesting thing to read nowadays because it deals with similar moral issues to what we continue to deal with and i i, I agree that he did know his audience and that's it could be who he was writing for especially during the 70s when he actually was visiting central asia there this was the time when he was actually working on his mass education book, which kind of flopped on the first edition and later was a little bit more successful. But he had this really ambitious idea to create like the first national education curriculum, which <laughs> is like really unheard of, like to teach peasants how to read and to teach them morality, I guess, to some degree through mm-hmm. different tales that he himself has translated from. Like, I mean, he read so many different languages, so he was really well educated and was able to pull those in. And so I think you get something that is very distilled. It has clearly its own bias. And it's like Tolstoy's vision in some way that is filtering all of these other different viewpoints and things that he may have read to give you what he thinks is a good value or virtue or whatever to have in an ideal society, which is obviously don't be greedy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, not yeah. That, it's not that hard to take away the main takeaway, which is don't be greedy. Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's so close to what he advocates, the idea of acquiring land, because he does want peasants to acquire land. However, he doesn't want them to acquire it in a capitalist sense, to buy it as private property. He wants them to join a, a commune or a mirror, which is what Pahom originally does. He's in a commune, and obviously there are problems. Certainly Tolstoy wasn't blind to that fact, but he's lured out of the commune by the, the merchant who comes by. But as the end of the story reveals... If you're wondering why the devil was there, because he doesn't really matter, he doesn't, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, all the people who always lured Pahom to the next place, the merchant, I think the other guy was a merchant as well, as it's kind of revealed in the end of the story by in a dream by Pahom, although he doesn't realize it, every one of those people were actually the devil themselves. They were people who were leading him on and, and dragging him into you know greater greed, I guess you could say, by showing him the greener grass, mm-hmm. uh, which really ties with, at this point in his life, of course, Tolstoy is really seeing his art not just as art itself, but as a vehicle for advancing not only good morality, but of course, Christian morality as he saw it. His own version of Christian morality, yeah. yeah. I guess it is worth pointing out, as you have mentioned in a former episode, that he was expelled from the Orthodox Church. Excommunicated. Excommun- thank you. He was excommunicated yes. from the Orthodox Church because he was militantly anti-Orthodox. <laughs> Or at least yes. against the church, as it as it was kind of in, in bed with the state. I think militantly anti-Orthodox is a good way to put it. The fact that he was not able to receive an Orthodox burial into this day still has not, I think, is a pretty good indication of how the Orthodox church feels about Tolstoy. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I just, I thought it was interesting that one of the reasons that Pahom was motivated for this whole journey was not just his internal desire for greed, which was, of course, there but also the fact that he was being penalized and fined what he felt was unjustly by the person, or I think it was the merchant that was managing the old lady's land, that he lived near when his cattle would stray and they would graze on her land. He would come and find mm-hmm. them all. And he was like, well, this is ridiculous. So I'm going to buy my own land. And there was like that transformation there where Tolstoy says, okay, now he's a landowner. He's not really a peasant. Mm-hmm. And it signals a right. changing in relations with the peasants around him because when they do the exact same thing that he did, he says, okay, now I'm going to find them because how else are they, they going to learn or whatever he says. Yeah. Uh, now he becomes just... separated from the other peasants yes. because in compare this, he doesn't make this explicit comparison, but compare it to, you know, commune, for example, Amir, where that's not really his land. So why would he be angry about it? Because that's the land that everyone goes to to chop their wood down. Or, you know, as village itself governs, right? So then there's like a community there, which I think is kind of an implicit thing, which he didn't draw in this story because he's trying to make a more so a morality play. But you can definitely see his bias against private property of any form 
in myriad ways in this text. Well, because I think he's getting to what is a little bit the idea of like what is natural for a peasant mm -hmm. or a, a farmer to do. I, I don't know. It seems to be that they want to use land and goods in a communal sort of way. I, I don't know. It's not like the peasants were doing anything maliciously, I don't think. And I think even when as, as a landowner, he realizes that's not what's going on. Mm -hmm. He just <laughs> feels frustrated because he paid for the land, but the peasants are just doing what they have to do. I know that Tolstoy is anti-socialist, but accidentally the story is a great example of Marx's theory of infinite accumulation mm -hmm. in, in, in capital-driven societies. Well, he's not so much, I don't know, like he, yeah, it, it's hard to say what, what, to pin down his politics exactly. I don't know if he's anti-anything per se, he's just more, in general, anti ideological he doesn't believe in the idea that you can adhere to an ideology because he doesn't really truly believe that two people can have the same understanding of the same idea he believes kind of that we will all have a different tint on the same idea mm. because of our right. our habits our understandings of the world and how that will filter these ideas through our minds and they will all be slightly different which again is interesting that he's writing this this morality tale which has a clear-cut ending I guess that's why you have a lack of detail when you look at, obviously, this is not Anna Karenina, but if you were to compare the two, this would be far less nuanced. And I guess the degrees to which you could filter a tale like Anna Karenina would be far different than how you would filter this. Not much filtering to be going on here. No, it's pretty self-apparent. I, I So this is not very deep. I just wanted to bring this up. This may be different in your translation. But I just thought this was really funny when the sisters are talking initially and they start debating when the younger sister says, oh, we have enough. The older sister says enough. Yes. If you'd like to share with the pigs and the calves, what do you know of <laughs> elegance or manners? However much your good man may slave, you will die as you are living on a dung heap and your children the same, which, oh my God, that's my worst Thanksgiving has never been nearly like that bad as this casual <laughs> conversation between these two sisters has gone. Yeah. I've never had anyone in my family, like, threaten my children with dying in a dung heap. <laughs> I don't think... My translation doesn't have it as her threatening, just speaking more okay. generally, that no matter what yeah. you do, this is what will happen. I don't think it's a threat, but... Your point stands that it is a pretty aggressive conversation <laughs> to be having between sisters. Yeah. It's a pretty aggressive conversation for anyone. Yeah, I think at this point it's worth mentioning not just the role of women, but the role of anybody else besides uh, Pahom in this story. I noticed this one line as I was reading this just now on the podcast where when he when he goes to, I think, the, the second place when they just kind of give him the land and it mm -hmm. says he's awarded 100 acres, 20 for each member of his family. That means him, his wife, and then that means he has three kids who are not mentioned at all except in this small parenthetical phrase here. <laughs> They play no role whatsoever. <laughs> like nobody plays a role except for him in the story. It's I think it's worse than mine because in my edition, I don't know. I wish I'd looked at the Russian real quickly to confirm this, but it says he was only given it. Uh, he's only given acres uh, per each son. Mm, interesting. Yeah, but that's uh, that's about par for the course for the Russian Empire in this era. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about the Bashkiri people a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a main point that probably doesn't really get talked about much, but there, there's this quote that I, you know, made, made me wince a little bit when the narrator is describing, and he says, the Bashkirs were very ignorant, knew no Russian, but they were kindly people. And of, of course, it made me wince because the idea that you were ignorant because you don't speak the language of your colonizers or conquerors. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know the read through. I was like, hmm, not great. It's also preceded by describing their life. <laughs> and maybe this is just because of Tolstoy's obsession with kumis. Um, mm. But their, his, his entire description of their life is, the woman prepared kumis, and they also made cheese. And as far as the men were concerned, drinking kumis and tea, eating mutton, playing on their pipes, was all they cared about. They were all stout and merry. And all summer long, they never thought of doing any work. So, obviously, there's a lot to read into there, just as terms of, like, how Western authors have all often disregarded the internal lives of like non-western people but also i i can't help but find it kind of funny that he just can't help make their entire lives just kind of revolve around gummies <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a little bit of projection going on though i think that's a good point in that there's no internal life of anybody in the story i don't I, I don't know what character 
has any verbs that describe feeling anything. It's all, how do I get land? I mean, that's that's it. It's a morality tale. They're not real people. They're just mm-hmm. archetypes in order to show you why greed is bad and also devilish. Greed is bad, but Kumis is phenomenal, apparently. <laughs> that's that's the real lesson of the story <laughs> it's the real lesson of the story it turns out that was the tale it wasn't the land it should be titled how much kumis does a man need <laughs> <laughs> never enough is the answer to that one it's never actually the enough. exact opposite of how much land a man needs <laughs> 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 one last thing again this isn't a deep thing to point out but it's kind of sad at the end when pahom has run presumably some number of miles to get back to the starting point uh, all the Bashkiri people are cheering him on. The chief of the, the Bashkiri people think, ah, oh, what a fine fellow. He's gained much land. And then he dies, and they go from, like, watching the sports games to clicking their tongues to show pity. <laughs> um, a lot of things you could say about that, but the image itself is pretty funny. I'm imagining, though, like, if this happened to me, I would be at least uh, a little bit surprised. So I'm envisioning a situation in which this has clearly happened before. Right. In which there are a lot of Russian people that are hoping to take advantage of this, thinking, oh, these people are absolute idiots. They're going to. Yeah. I pay them a thousand rubles and I take as much land as I can mark in a day. That's a great deal. Surely that's. They're idiots for thinking that. That's a good deal. Right. And well, it ends up costing him his life because he's too greedy. Uh, I mean, maybe it's a good way of choosing your neighbors, actually, because if you can put them through a test which ensures that they're relatively sound of mind and you know not too greedy <laughs> then you <laughs> you already have a good character test because everyone who survived is less uh, less expansively minded than uh, Perhaps, all the dead yeah. ones i guess yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. well matt before you completely finish up on a scale of one to yeltsin how drunk are you i don't know if it pertains to drunkenness but i think i'm ready to try kumis now i'd be curious <laughs> too so that's at least a seven at least i mean yeah I'm just curious. I remember I mean, your like, attitude towards Cumius when we were in Russia, so I know that that's high up on the on the meter. Did we? Tr- did we? Did you have the chance to try it when we were in Russia? I forgot. No, we didn't. We didn't have the chance to try it, but we had a lot of late night conversations about it. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I just the idea of like people who just you know I don't want to get back onto it because I'll never have the <laughs> podcast. But people who just you know sit down to a meal and they're ready to drink a tall glass of milk. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't that you you don't need the calcium eat a vegetable eat a vegetable <laughs> eat a deep green Cameron what about you uh I'm probably about a three I would like to drink more but the whiskey is expensive and also yes, I've yes. finally decided that it's time for me to start running again mm. uh, it's been about six months since I quit and unfortunately I <laughs> when I was actually running like every day I was really in good shape and felt good all the time and now i just kind of wake up and i like feel tired and old uh yeah, so i'm kind yeah, of yeah. hoping that running will make me feel young and you know young and beautiful again yes yes i also feel old and tired at the ripe age of 22 <laughs> which is probably not great <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> that aside uh, what are we reading next week matt next week we are going to be reading the two short stories the third son and the cow by andre platonov Be sure to bring your livestock and your social commentary. It is going to be a good one. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you enjoyed the episode, well, first of all, that makes us happy. But also, grad school doesn't pay very well, so if you happen to have a few dollars to spare, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. It'll help us buy the books we'll be reading in the future. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or visit our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. <laughs>